in, I mean, you see results immediately. And then uh, it's good to have my Canon here, yeah, my very own Edmo, always there, always faithful, always supporting his Aburo. Thank you so much uh, for, for this. I'm, I'm sure looking forward to September that uh, I'll have time to, to meet you. Yeah, interestingly, meet you one-on-one -on -one physically for the first time. Wow, September. That September must happen. By all means, it must happen. So thank you. Thank you so much sir, for the support and really, really appreciate it. Um, good. So today we'll be talking about what next? What next? You know, we've always had people tell us over and over and over again that, look, you don't give up. Don't give up. Stay there. Don't give up. Don't stay there. Many people's destiny has been crushed because they were told to stay there when they are supposed to have moved on. So <laughs> we, we need to know when to stay and when to move. When to stay, when not to move. That's why the, the topic tonight is a very, very interesting topic. What next? Is it expansion? Is it doubling down or exit? Do I need to get out? Do I need to, in other words, I'm sure probably Sam David is going to give us plan B and plan C or, or plan up to F <laughs> even if possible. <laughs> the, way, the, way, the way the whole thing is going. So you must have your plan A, plan B, plan C, and then you must know. I don't know. I don't want to preempt him, but you know Samson has a way of getting to the bottom of all this. So again, just like Emmanuel has welcomed, welcomed us, we are, um, this is the knee at this uh Keeping your business in business webinar. We have this every Saturday, 7 p.m. And then we'll bring in um, luminaries, visionaries, intelligent people, fantastic people to come in. And once they come in, they take us through um, their own thoughts and their own mindset so that we can learn and prepare for what is happening. And then, you know, one good thing about the NIA Desire um, program, whether webinar, whether keeping your business in business, that it has helped a whole lot of people to get their bearings right. It has helped us to be able to chart a course for ourselves, even in the midst of pandemic. In the midst of pandemic, we've been able to get a whole lot of things done. I remember one of the sessions that we had with Samson Davids. You know, then we were told, you know, then from history, uh, they told us, they said that once there's a pandemic, you have to go for cheap, uh, very affordable uh, commodities or um, services. You have to reduce your price. You have to reduce your fee. But the interesting thing is that it came in with a different perspective. He came in and he challenged us and I stayed there. Thank God I listened to him. And then, you know, boom. Like they say, the rest is history. Uh, in my own organization, we've not had... Um, We've not had the best of years that we've had this time. I mean, this 12 calendar months, whatever you count it from, whether from March to March or from April to April or from May to May or from June to June, we've never had a best calendar month, not ever in our history, in our history. So Samson came and told us, don't mind them. Every man must come up with his own strategy. You can't be working on other people's strategy. You can't be working on a generic stuff. You have to get specific. Thank God he said that. And thank God I listened. And thank God, like I, like I said, we are reaping the benefit and the fruit of what he shared with us. So today is going to be also an awesome day, a great day, a wonderful day. And I'm sure he's absolutely ready. He's absolutely ready. Uh, Emmanuel, I think without further ado... Uh, I think we just need to bring yes. up um, Samson Davids right now so that he can get the ball rolling and then all our questions can be fired at him. Boom, 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 like that. Yes. Yes, guys. Everyone, please get something to write. Samson Davids is going to be, is going to be giving out a lot of case studies, if I'm correct. I'm sure he's going to be... He's uh, it, uh, a case study man. The practical. case study man. <laughs> <laughs> so just get something to write so that you can interpolate or whatever it is, correlate those case studies and come up with 
a strategic step forward. So please guys, let's put our hands together. Let's make welcome Samson David. Can we go to the chat box and welcome him and you know make him feel glad tonight? And if you can turn on your videos, please do. We would appreciate that. It does help the speaker. Please go to the chat box and welcome him. Before Samson starts speaking, welcome. The, the, the interesting thing, the yes. reason why we I have this is for me to see faces. But interesting, I'm not seeing faces, I'm yes. just seeing pictures. So I, I was told. <laughs> Nigerians, I was told that it doesn't really matter. The same is the same data, whether it is a picture or video, it's the same data that you are born in. So let's switch it up. Let's see your beautiful faces. Make my background colorful. Make my background colorful. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we need to spotlight something and then unmute him. Yes. You want to unmute him? Or Samson will unmute himself. Samson, over to you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Emmanuel Onoa. Good evening, sir. And good evening to everyone that has uh, signed in to join. Uh, Thank you. It's good, it's good to be back here today after uh, a break for some time. And um, so uh, the conversation goes thus. I'm sure today I won't be as for too long as I used to. Uh, I'll try and um, you know, compress what I have to say. So that we can have an interactive session and do some Q and A's, basically. Uh, but then to start with, uh, when we reached out for us to do this today, uh, we were debating on what exactly to talk about, and then it was more like um, what you know could actually uh, be the focus. Uh, we ruminated over a couple of topics, and then uh, the idea about. What should people actually do next? I mean, it come up, uh, came up rather. Uh, we've had a couple of conversations during COVID. Uh, we've had conversations that has to do with the pandemic a couple of times. And then back out, uh, we now have to, uh, oh, let's do like uh, a partial review of some of what a couple of us have done during the COVID period. Uh, take a stock of uh, how far we have come and then determine what, what exactly is next, you know, after COVID. Uh, most economies are prepared to uh, swing into action, you know, maybe from June or July. Literally, most economies are open up. People have, you know, resumed traveling again. Um, thank God to the um, uh, um, speed of vaccination that is going on across the world. So we have to have a few uh, pressure and uh, businesses is seeming to return to normal, you know. But then, as we all uh, try to return to normal, uh, a couple of us have been battered, uh, either in one way or the other. There are people with two, three offices uh, that have not been able to like uh, sustain two, three offices in the last one year of COVID. Uh, I'm sure by this time last year. Uh, we're not sure what the fate of the next one year will look like. So definitely, I haven't gone through a full year of COVID, uh, and then we're going into like maybe a second year. I remember Nigeria went into lockdown March 30, 2020. Um, and then <clears throat> this is almost the end of 2020. Uh, and there were conversations around, uh, maybe there'll be a second or, or a third week. You know, we finally experienced a second wave. People like India going through what looks like a third wave. Um, so we we're basically as we proceed into the end of, of uh, the second quarter of 2021 to ascertain how far we have all fared uh, during the pandemic and then uh, what's actually next. As to proceed into uh, the remaining months 
I'm going to look at uh, cases across you know, several uh, industries, uh, but I'll start with a paper you are all familiar with. And that has to do with the case of a group called Tolaram. Uh, Tolaram are the owners of um, uh, what, we, what we all know today and consume as Indomie. Uh, but Tolaram's story didn't start with Indomie. Tolaram has a 73 year history. The company was founded in 1948. Tolaram is as old as the People's Republic of China of today. You know, um, so, um, and the idea from the beginning, from the genesis, was to go into the business, the core business of textiles, textiles manufacturing. You know, this was a company that, you know, took off from Indonesia, spread to Singapore, you know, and then the rest of the world. Uh, at some point in 1978, you know, these guys brought the textile business to Nigeria. You know, but unfortunately, for those that are familiar with Lagos, there used to be a swan every Tuesday, you know, somewhere in the solo. You know, those were the people. Um, so the business of fabric, the business of textile that has been successful, that has kept them in business since 1948 when they started actually what they exported to Nigeria in 1978. And um, having done that in Nigeria, I was looking busy. As for any market, every Tuesday was a go-to for a lot of people and I would go and shop as for any clothes and what have you. They created what looked like uh, uh, today's Black Friday, you know, was like a free for all, you know. Business began to fail. You know, I went to fail. They, they identified. So at that junction, they asked them, yes, we've done this forever. Yes, we've been very successful in textile. We've been in politics to the United Kingdom. We've been successful, opened a branch even in the United States in textile. So what, is, what next are we going to do? Um, there was nothing else they could do at that time other than to look at maybe there was need to now rethink their strategy and begin to think about what's next to sell. Uh, in coming up with that solution, there was this product that has been marketed by a group called Salim in Indonesia. It's, a, it's an Indonesian state in the name was the uh, from the from the coining of Indonesia. So Toleran partnered with Salim to first bring Indomie to Nigeria. And that was after 10 years of existing in the, in the same Nigerian market. So uh, there's always this arrogance, you know, about I've done this thing for years, I've done this thing, I'm a, I'm a veteran in this industry, something that I've done for 10 years, you know, I should be successful at it. I shouldn't. What more? How best can I do? But it was clear to Ram at that point in time that that business was not sustainable, and that that model was not going to sustain their brand. So what they have to do was to eat the refresh button, you know, and uh, come up with another thing to offer the same market, you know, that they have tried them, especially in Nigeria where they have been for 10 years, from 1978 to 1980. So they started with the idea of first bringing Indomie to Nigeria, making profit. After about six years or so, it wasn't a profitable venture for them. Now they have produced this product. Come uh, uh, import the recipe to Nigeria and produce on Mars. So that was when they started the Agbara factory somewhere in the United States. You know, the, and for the idea at that time was to produce local. It will shock you that after they did that strategy, Indomie was still not successful. Uh, they were still struggling with it. There were losses on losses, despite the fact that they still had they had you know uh, looked inward in that way. But then, by 1996, the group was actually querying 
if at all, they should still have anything to do with textile. So what did they do? They resolved to divest completely from textile business because that wasn't it just going to be uh, what to continue with. I, I haven't started that as far back as 1948. So they created a new vision for themselves, created a new mission statement for themselves. And that new mission statement was structured around about four industries. Number one was real estate. But in the area of real estate, we're going to book residential by, build, by building of condominiums. So they started with the introduction of condominiums. And then they said, okay, they're also going to venture into consumer goods. So after consumer goods, they also considered the idea of energy, the idea of infrastructure financing, and the, and the idea of digital services. So if you look at the new business idea these guys have come up with, it completely has nothing to do with their past. It completely has to do with nothing they, should, they are supposed to have been masters of. So to a large extent, these guys built a new vision on Indomie. So it was something that looked like, are we going to be successful at this? Because there was actually two groups of people that came up with this idea of, should we have the textile business? Or should we look at how we can innovate ourselves textile business? Or this Indomie school of thought that you guys are saying we should export to, to Nigeria and the rest of other countries. How profitable is it going to be in the long run? But they took a big bet on it. As a matter of fact, I've interviewed the group CEO of Africa on two different, three different occasions, you know, which are published in the magazine, where he shared their vision, he shared his pain, the stories, you know, what they went through in, in venturing from textile to Indomie of today that we all seem to enjoy. Now, because of their first mover advantage in that industry. And as of 2015, Indomie was already about a billion dollar industry in Nigeria already at that time. These guys already controlled about 70% of the industry. When our big boy, Aniko Dangote, ventured into that industry with Dangote Nubi, they acquired Dangote Nubi sharply. They didn't waste time. They went to him, negotiated with him. We'd like to buy you outside. We don't like you to be our competitor, sir. And then they match that wing of their business to their own Indomie structure. <laughs> now, by 2015, these guys sat down again. Even before 2015, by the middle, by the beginning of the new century, in the early 2000s, the tolerant group had sat down to ask themselves, what are we doing in the new millennium? As you and I were shouting, oh, Y2K, happy new millennium, or whatever, these guys came up with an idea. And what are we going to offer in this new millennium as we progress? And in that space and that spirit, these guys went ahead and created a completely new vision for the new millennium. And the idea at that time was, OK, we are getting to be successful in Nigeria. We're getting to be successful in another part of the world. How do we consolidate on what we have achieved? So on January 15 or thereabouts, in, in 2015, the management of Torah needed to decide. We are now, we now appear to be successful in Nigeria. With this success that we have achieved, should we actually consider? So they divided themselves into two groups again. Group one was supposed to decide whether they should expand to other African countries namely five countries, which are Egypt, Ivory Coast, uh, Ethiopia, Cote d'Ivoire, and Kenya. Another group was of the opinion that well, we have been successful in Nigeria, but we have not actually covered you know, a larger part of Nigeria. Is it possible we double down on Nigeria rather than the idea of us capitalizing on whatever we have done in Nigeria? So that group, so one group advocated to stay in Nigeria and double down on Nigeria. Another group advocated that Toleram should actually expand to other five African countries, you know, and also capture the success story. Now, from 1948 to 2015, all Toleram have done is simple. They identify a product that is successful in Indonesia, for example, and export it to the US and Nigeria and the UK go to places like Estonia. 
Now in Nigeria, they're asking themselves, Indomie has been successful in Nigeria as far back as 2015. What next should we do? Should we expand to the rest of Nigeria? Maybe we're only strong in the Southwest, or maybe we're only strong in the Southern, South Southern part of Nigeria. Is it possible we expand to the Northern part? Or is it possible we go, we just leave Nigeria and go and capitalize on other African markets? Maybe we should focus on, we should focus on some other African countries, you know, that might have the same population like Nigeria. But, and that was one of the reasons why a, a country like Ethiopia came into, the, came into the equation at that time. But there was this chief marketing officer for Tora. His name is Power. Power is actually a friend. Power was of the opinion that there is still more to be done in Nigeria. That it is not yet time to exist or diversify their interest into other parts of Nigeria, into part, other parts of Africa. That yes, they may look at a few that they could venture into or that they could penetrate, but it believed there was still much to be done, including some of the issues they were having. And what were those issues? At that time, Tolerant had not done their backward integration. Tolerant still relied on a couple of Nigerian other businesses, you know, to drive home, let's say, delivery, for an example. They still believed on a network of vendors, a network of retailers to sell their product. At that time, they still believed in a lot of, there were a lot of services that were sold that had anything, nothing to do with the of Tolerant. So what did these guys do? They sat down with themselves and said, we are having issues with even satisfying the growing demand of our product. Is it possible we tidy that up before we begin to think about expansion? So what did they do? Those guys built 500 retail shops to distribute in the 500,000 retail shops to distribute in the of their own. They had to set up a distribution company for that purpose by directly investing in trucks of their own in the first place. One of that model was the fact that these guys came up with the fact that they can't continue to rely on Nigerian suppliers, distributors that they want. And say, oh guy, you have not delivered to so, 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 so. And the guy will tell them, ah, my truck spoil, my distance spoil. Ah, sorry, maybe tomorrow I will meet up. So what they have to do was to directly invest in that themselves and possibly see if that will ramp up sales. And I would shock you, me, that between that time and now, those guys have crossed into the region of about $2 billion in terms of revenue. Now, they didn't stop there. Rather than expand physically into other countries. Of course, they eventually went into, into a country like Egypt. They were, they were also in Cote d'Ivoire at some point. You know, uh, the Cote d'Ivoire internal political crisis existed there, and then they went back again. But then it's, it's almost obvious to almost everybody right now that to do a billion dollar business in Africa, you have to operate only for about three countries. If not, the rest is just a joke. You either operate from Nigeria, operate from South Africa, or operate from Egypt. In the rest of those other countries, you know, you might really not get the scale, even if you have a very favorable environment, like people would say, or you have a very enabling environment, like people would say. In, in, in the question I usually ask people most times is, what is the valuation of some of these countries when they mention them? You know, because again, a lot of our people are really not that familiar with the valuation of some of these countries. And that would also give me a lead into the recent ranking that we did. Um, about this time last year, uh, one of the profiles I carry is to actually be the publisher of Nigeria's 50 biggest corporations. So, but by this time last year, we sat down to ask ourselves after we had published, uh, I think we were working on uh, the next edition you know, for, for Nigeria's 50 biggest corporation. I was going to be published sometime in July during the pandemic last year. And then we asked ourselves, when 2021 comes, are we still going to continue with Nigeria's 50 biggest corporation? 
And then we sat down and agreed during the pandemic via Zoom videos. Now, why don't we rank Africa? Why should we continue to rank Nigeria's biggest corporation? And that statement that actually happened when I sat down with the MD of Guarantee Trust Bank to interview him two years earlier, and a year earlier rather. And then during our conversation, uh, GTB had written to inform GTB that they were the largest bank in Nigeria by market capitalization. As of 2019, GTB had a market cap of, of about $3.6 billion at that time. And there was no bank in Nigeria that came close to them. So obviously, they were the biggest in Nigeria. But you know, there is this impression that you have that once you are the biggest in Nigeria, you are the biggest in Africa. That once you are this in Nigeria, you know, you are that in, to the rest of the world. But then that would also lead me to uh, a certain Yoruba adage that talks about meaning uh, the, the, the way and manner you perceive yourself from the comfort zone of a Nigerian success story might deem your vision about how in actual fact you are being in, in, in the context of either Africa or the rest of the world. So it was so funny that we now decided that like, why don't you compare Nigerian companies, another African country, another another and the other African countries' companies? And then in the course of our conversation, the MD of GTB asked me that am I sure they are not the largest in Africa? To which I responded to him that I'm not sure. You know, I wasn't even sure. So I just tried his response basically. Like, are you for real? $3.6 billion for the rest of Africa? But then we continued the conversation. And as well, we have it. Uh, we started the request to rank Africa's largest corporation sometime in May, May, June last year. And by December, after a lot of back and forth presentation, you know, because of the pandemic, I couldn't physically go to some of those countries for them to see me physically. But after a lot of back and forth presentations, due diligence, investigation, up to how we refund this process, I explained my revenue model to them. And one of them said, okay, we well, wish you best of luck, but we don't have money. I said, don't worry, I don't need one dollar from you. And then that was how we proceeded. By January 2nd this year, while I was landing in Abuja, uh, you know, I had gone to Groove in Lagos, you know, so I returned to Abuja January 2nd. And as I landed in Abuja, I received the approval, you know, introducing our firm to all the stock exchanges in Africa. So how do we do our ranking, you know, maybe for those that are meeting me for the first time? What we do is still order after the standard and poor 500. Whereas standard and poor 500 is ranked based on your standing, your valuation on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. So if you are not listed on those platforms, you know, your company is not a publicly traded company, you're not going to be ranked because anybody can cook their books anyway. So it was not based on individual uh, 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 valuation. It was based on a public valuation, especially if you are listed on the exchange. So we partnered the Nigerian Stock Exchange to do Nigeria's 50 biggest corporations, which we call the Signature 50. So we're going to do the Africa's biggest corporation, which we call the Signature 100. Uh, we called it uh, uh, so we approached all the stock exchanges in Africa through the association, you know, to verify. So each stock exchange will verify that these are the companies on our platforms and these are their valuations. So me and my guys will sit down and do an analysis of which is number one, which is number two, which is number three, which is number four. To shock you, we eventually did the publication sometimes in April, last month, April, uh, 2021, releasing, you know, but you know, we don't release our documents to the public because of the depth of research that has gone into it. It would shock you that in Africa, you have about 300 companies that has a minimum valuation of about, of about $100 million. Now, of those 300 companies, that has a, because there's an entry, there's a benchmark to be, to, to be verified, you must, your company must be worth minimum $100 million. That's to be ranked among Africa's largest corporations. So we now did a routine check. Of those 300 companies in Africa, we also did an extra of companies that had the valuation of $1 billion and above. 
there are about 100 of those companies for information. Now, of those 100 companies alone across Africa, South Africa has eight, Nigeria has nine. Now, you know, there's this battle between Nigeria and South Africa, just like the same battle between Nigeria, between the US and China, on who is bigger, on who is larger, and all that. But in clear terms, US can be the largest country in the world in terms of uh, gross domestic product. Um, um, uh, yes, by GDP, by nominal value, rather. But when it comes to purchasing power parity, China is actually the largest, bigger than the US. Now, when it comes to valuations of corporations in Africa, South Africa and Nigeria are not made. In, in no, in, by no way, by no standard, they are not even made at all. So the question the MP of GTB asked me, I finally found the answer. As a matter of fact, the largest bank in Africa is First Round Limited of South Africa. They are valued at about $18 billion. So GTB is not even close. Now, the essence of this analysis is to tell you about the riches in Africa, is to tell you about how vast we are, the, um, the quantum of investment that resides in the continent called Africa. As a matter of fact, for a long time, a lot of us had assumed that once you are the richest man in Africa, your company is also the largest in Africa. The margin is from heaven to earth. The largest company in Africa is Proso, the owners of BSD, the owners of NASPAS. You know, but because you know our Liko is the largest person, you know, is the richest person in, in, the, in the richest black person, so to speak. So we are usually assume that Liko will be the, the, the Aliko's company will be the biggest in Africa. The margin between them is seven and eight. Proso has a valuation of one seventy four billion dollars. United States dollar. Dangote is about ten point one billion dollar. That's Dangote uh, cement. Of course, Dangote has two other companies: the Nascon National Salt Company and uh, Dangote Sugar. But even when you have those two together, you are not close to one seventy four billion dollars. The largest company in Nigeria is Dangote Cement, apparently, which is only valued at ten point one billion dollars. Now, what's my point? My point is, there's a depth of riches in Africa. And so when companies like Toram sat down to ask themselves, what exactly should we do? Should we look beyond Nigeria or should we consolidate on Nigeria? Should we double down on Nigeria? It was clear to them that they had not even tap into the 200 million growing population of Nigeria. It was clear to them that this was not the time to use the same money you use in building 500,000 stores. to go and enter Cote d'Ivoire. Or use that same money to go and enter Kenya. Or use that same money to go and enter Ethiopia. It was clear to them that the cost of going to set up businesses in those areas would actually expand their network of distribution, which is the backward integration. They had a peculiar operational crisis that they needed to manage. They were managing people that were not manageable. So it was a no-brainer for them to say, hey, in the spirit of expansion or in the spirit of going Pan-Africa, let me join the ship and go and have a branch in Ghana. Those are wonderful things to do, I believe. Those are very beautiful things to do. Of course, for your information, Toram is in Ghana, and they're also in a couple of other West African countries. But I must tell you that they actually looked at their internal issues and actually doubled down first on capturing the opportunities right at the tip of their finger before thinking about, okay, let's go for an African, what have we not been able to do in, in Africa? Okay, maybe, yes, it's fancy to call those tips. But at the same time, uh, I would also encourage that as you look at one size doesn't fit all for every business. As you look at what you are supposed to do, you should also look at it in this form. One of what Toram did was this. Beyond the physical expansion that they have contemplated, in 2015, they also did 
some business expansion. And what were those business expansion? Number one, they sat down and realized that after their partnership with the Salim Group, the owners of Indomie in Indonesia, to bring the same Indomie to Nigeria, why don't they expand their product offering beyond Indomie? And you know what they did? They signed an agreement with the Ala Group of Denmark to bring to Nigeria Danone. They didn't stop there. They went to the US. They signed a partnership with Kellogg's to bring their cereal product to Nigeria. In short, Toronto has now gone beyond partnering, selling, partnering this or partnering that. Toronto has gone into even granite oil. They are the owners of power. So largely, what they did was to look at the ecosystem of consumer goods and ask themselves, what have they not introduced? But there is also a caveat in your expansion of product line. And the caveat are this. Companies like Coca-Cola, for an example, uh, got carried away with uh, the, uh, the market size that was being controlled by the by energy drink. And they introduced a Coca-Cola energy drink, you know, not long ago. About two weeks ago, or about one month, they discontinued that product line. In short, in thinking about the right product line to introduce, I also mentioned how Apple, before Steve Jobs came in. There was a certain CEO of Apple that felt if they are into the business of computer, why shouldn't they be into the business of photocopier? If they are into the business of photocopier, why shouldn't they go into the business of toner? In short, at some point, he was contemplating whether they should go into uh, clothes, clothing line, that Apple should launch a clothing line. So you can imagine how crazy some ideas can run up to you as a CEO and then you ask yourself, like, ah, we can actually do this. It's a product line. It's connected to us. It has something to do with us. But not until September 1997. This is a case study we have shared before. When people like Steve Jobs came in, I said, maybe the problem Apple has was because there was computer in the name of the company. You know, Apple used to be Apple computers. So part of what that guy did was to completely delete the computer in their name and only call it Apple Incorporated. And that was how he sat down, faced out a lot of competition that they didn't even need in the first place, like toner, like copier, and other kind of lines other CEOs had ventured into. And the guy began to rethink the idea of what exactly they are supposed to do, the kind of businesses they are supposed to do. So when you look at the idea of what's next, when you look at the, the, the business of what's next, when you look at your business and you ask yourself, what, what, what's next should we do? Out of the questions you ask yourself is, okay, if you are expanding, in what area are you expanding? Do you want to physically expand or you want to expand your product and service? The mistake most people make is expansion to them. Oftentimes it's branching. Oh, we're in Lagos, it's time to go to Abuja. And then you come to Abuja, you come to Wusetu, you ask for your rent or you want to acquire a property, they give you a bill of maybe 10, 15 million there. Before you say that, obviously, you're thinking maybe about 40 million or 30 million or thereabout. Just trying to physically have an office in Abuja. Whereas just in Lagos, it's possible you've only been able to cover the mainland. You must explore the island, or you may explore some other opportunity right at the tip of your finger. But in your head, we should be in Abuja, we should be in Portacos, we should be in Nogu, we should be here, we should be there. So part of what I also want us to think about is some of the strategies deployed by Tolera. One of which was, we should not just expand our product, we should not just expand our physical presence as a company, we should also expand our product line. Beyond selling Indomie, if we have moved from selling clothes every Tuesday in the Swami market to Indomie, and we have been successful from 1988 for 33 years to now, what else can we sell? So they decided to you know, bring in Danone. They decided to venture into the partnership with Kellogg's to bring in cereal. There was a time the chairman CEO of PepsiCo, Indra Noe, 
said PepsiCo does not have a product before 12 a.m. for people to buy, before 12 noon, rather, for people to buy. There is it possible for PepsiCo to acquire a product such that PepsiCo can start making money before 12 noon every day? Not many people would settle to have a chill bottle of Pepsi before 12 noon in the afternoon. Not many people will. And for that reason, they acquired Gatorade, which is an healthy product. So you might want to ask yourself, because if the definition of expansion in your head talks about a physical presence in a certain country or in a certain place or in a certain state, how about other forms of expansion? If all you have offered me all your life is in Dumi, who told you I'm contented with picnic and cowbell for the rest of my life? Who told you I won't be interested in Danone meat if they offer me a better product? Who told you I'm not having issues or constipation when I take other products? So we might need to broaden our definition of expansion. When I talk about doubling down, we are easily moved and excited about a new life we are not familiar with, or we are not aware, or we have not been properly trained for. You know, I, I, it's quite easy to look at me and say, me, there's something that is making waves now, and I need you to also join me to, you know, uh, to, to invest in this market. Look at what I have done. You can do the same. You, know, you can make this money, you can make this money, you can make that money. I fail to put me in context. How has me been making money? How has me made money for the last five years? How has me made money in the last 10 years? What can me do going forward? I have sold my vision. That is not Nii's vision to me. And Nii would likely get trapped along the line because Nii is not me. We don't share the same DNA. But at some point, I've given the Nii, Nii the impression that don't worry, I will guide you. I won't guide Nii forever. Neither will I be available to guide Nii forever. So in as much as Nii likes what I'm doing, in as much as I have some successful stories to, talk, to tell me about what I'm doing and how successful it is. Nii might not really, really be able to work my vision. My vision is not Nii's vision. So the mistake people make oftentimes is to venture areas that look good like a booming market. And when that boom turns to a bust, they are consumed with a bust. Because there was really no critical analysis there was no career projection from what to what. So my point is, if you are considering expansion, if you are considering doubling down in your industry, or is it actually the time to look at the entire portfolio of the business and cut your losses, which is the exit strategy of we're failing badly in this area. And this is not the time to continue. An exit might be in two ways, I must explain. There's an individual exit to pursue other endeavors while the business is sustained. There's the complete exit of you and the business from that line of business. What is safer and what most CEOs have done is an individual exit. A time to allow someone else to think for the company is one of the exits you can consider. It is possible you are the older manager and you are, you are actually spent. And I'll give you a few examples. When the owners of Google realize there may be more to you to offer the world, they realize this idea of you are president, me, I'm CEO. Uh, and how we offer the world is a search engine. All we're asking the world to do is to come and give us money for advance. Is there another thing we can offer the world? So both men stepped down from the leadership of Google and appointed Eric Schmidt to lead Google going forward. Both owners now became chief technical officer and another person, the chief marketing officer. In those years that both of them stepped down from running Google, which was their first success, in the years that followed, they created Gmail. In the to rival Yahoo Mail. In the years that followed, YouTube was acquired. In the years that followed, 
Gmail, uh, uh, Google Map was, was launched. In the years that followed, they even came up with the biggest competition. So in the phone, in the, in the, in the, in the, tele, in the telecommunication industry, which they never envisaged before, which is Android. They acquired Android. Imagine a world with iOS alone without Android. Because what was before that time was Nokia's, uh, was seen there. Yes. That was the only phone operating system that existed. Nokia and them, uh, what's this Razor, Razor phone that we used to use there? Uh, Motorola, they were the kings. But these guys stepped down that our lives can be more than search engine. We should be able to offer the world more than search engine. So they didn't shut down Google. What they did was to exit the leadership of Google and appointed someone else, Eric Schmidt, to continue to pilot their first success. And went I to create new successes, new success stories. What am I saying in essence is that beyond your first success story, your second success story, the capability in creating the first and second success story would be different from the capabilities you would need to create the third and fourth success story. But you know, for a long time, we get carried away with the successes we have achieved. We get carried away. And we actually revel in the ignorance that knew exactly the way. Then they never did anything that prompted, that would prompt them to say, hey, what, what exactly are we doing? How else can we do it? Or how best can we do it? So essentially, uh, different strokes for different folks. Uh, what is applicable to me is establishment, may not work for me. And uh, what works for me also not work for you. Um, so in reviewing each other's uh, entity, each other's establishment, there might be need for a critical look and assessment as to what area to do. Should you exit? If you should you consider of branches of business or the expansion of business product life in terms of what you what you have to offer people. And in most cases, I have to give you uh, uh, a tip in coming up with some of those solutions. Uh, most innovation in Africa are competition driven and not just Africa. Most CEOs are across the world. They sit back, look at what their competitor is doing. Google, even Facebook and Instagram, they are one of those two places. So it's not just, it's not just particular about Africa. They sit back, look at what the other competitor will do, and then do the same. And I'll give you examples. An example was when Snap came up. And these guys tried to acquire Snap, but that failed both of them. Uh, Facebook tried to acquire Snap, but that failed woefully. When that strategy failed, they created the uh, Instagram story. Yeah, that you can create the story on your platform. So the story that they would have acquired from Snap, because the idea for Snap was that the chat would delete and will not be permanent, or the story or whatever Snap you made will not be permanent on your page. The solution they have to offer whatever you post on their platform stays there, except you delete it. So they said, oh, so since these guys are coming up with a solution that would disappear in 24 hours or thereabout, okay, we're gonna create a story. When that failed, TikTok came. When they realized that TikTok would not be acquired, they created Instagram Reel. So what the Facebook current strategy is, Competitor driven. So, in fact, Facebook is no longer leading from the front. And these are the guys that own Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. So, your story can be like Facebook, where you only sit back and wait for where your computer is going, and then you just pick your head. I gave a little analysis of when I used to live in Lagos, and there is traffic on the Kurudu Road or 
in, uh, in Yaba or somewhere, and we decide to follow somebody that decides to drive somewhere, and you, everybody follows that guy, thinking there's a shortcut that will bring us out, out in front of you, that, or that you come and go and go out in front of that. There was one location I ended, I ended in front of somebody's gate, thinking that uh, he was navigating his way to come out at the expert. Bro, I ended up in front of his gate. By that they always get to you. I said, oh, sorry. I thought you were trying to get to the mirror. So that idea of that idea of looking at what others are doing, you know, and simply replicating the same. I can go on and on. There are several cases I can cite here. And then at the end of the day, there's a there's a a a, a, a telephone company in Spain called Telefonica. When WhatsApp came. The Republicans said they were there. So you know what they did? They said, okay, we can't tell you people. So they went to set up a small unit. Develop whatever WhatsApp is doing. Because WhatsApp, they saw how WhatsApp was triangulating IBM, DBM, Blackberry. So they felt, okay, all they do is, this is a chatting platform. Let us, let us also create our own. But there was a problem. Which was the same problem I encountered when I joined the board of Mac in Abuja. When you create a team of young people, or when you create a team of innovators and you give, you give them a very beautiful name, and you seclude them from the system, whereby the system is operating on its own, and then that new unit is your baby, they will be the one to drive the changes in the future. Okay? Whatever those units operate or innovate, the day or moment any of those people leave that organization, they will crumble everything they have done. The system will crumble everything they have done. Some of what I innovated, except the ones that are generating money, none has been sustained today. None. None. And I, give, I can give you an example. One of the ones that has been sustained today because they know that one is money making, so people won't just wake up and crash something that is working. We used to look for niece, friends, families that want to do third party and insurance. That was how we were marketing it. Insurance is one of the most difficult products to sell now. So the way to market it, the way we were taught, eh, was that. Go to your church, go to your friends, go to your pastor. These are people that, you, that ask us. Market them to support you. They should support your business. They should support what you are doing. Sometimes they will even issue you a, a warning letter that if you don't produce a certain amount before end of so, 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 they will sack you. So you now go and show that letter to your church member, to your friends, that please so don't let them sack me or want to want to. Little was achieved with those strategies. There was a lady that was given, I think, 1,000 accounts all of four 90 days or so. And this lady earns about 800K. This was in one of these banks some years ago. Me, when the lady, in short, behind, at her back seat, inside her official car, she has the account opening form for her bank inside that back seat. All they told her was give us 1,000 accounts in, uh, in 90 days' time. If you can't give us 1,000 accounts, we'll sack you. So what this lady did was Samson, so that I can attend every management meeting and, and tell them that I've done something. I have the forms in my book. They said minimum opening balance of 5,000 there. Samson, please just sign this part. I'll go and put the 5,000 there myself. So sometimes some of the results you are seeing uh, I really not really resolved because I can't even remember ever having that account today. So that was the same with top party. We, they used to motivate people to talk to their friends, talk to their pastors, look into their network, send broadcast, uh -uh, send broadcast messages, tell them this is what you are into. You can do it. You get? But when we got there, we realized we might not succeed with that. We realize we might not succeed with the support my business kind of strategy. We have to find a way to build it in into what people originally buy. And how did we do that? 
And I was part of a group that came up with what they call bank assurance model in 2004. So what we did at that time was to have, I was working for a subsidiary of Standard Trust Bank at that time, called Health Insurance. And I was actually in the admin department. So what the company did was to employ like 700 people, persons, and, and deploy them to about 700 branches of Standard Trust Bank across Nigeria. So inside the banking hall of each Standard Trust, there's an insurance desk where every insurance related document that are needed are issued immediately. So whether you want a marine certificate immediately, there's somebody that's gonna give it to you there. Whether they want to finance the car for you, there's somebody that will do the insurance there. So all the insurance related businesses that was, that was going on with banking product or that were tied to banking product had a physical staff of our branch, of our company rather, in each of those standard trust uh, bank branches. So all I did was to replicate that bank assurance model, which was a partnership between health insurance and standard trust bank at that time. I replicated it with all BIOs in Nigeria. And how did we do that? I went to Bobui here in Abuja, the core marshal of FRSC, and offered to host all the heads of FRSC in all the 30 states of the Federation, along with their VIO counterparts. So we invited them to Abuja and sold the vision to them. They were going to have an insurance desk in each of the VIO offices across Nigeria, starting with Abuja. It would shock you to know me that once you go to any of those VIO offices, as they are processing your vehicle particulars, vehicle license, vehicle this thing, it naturally comes with a third party document. So if you are supposed to renew or get your new plate number for 30 or 35,000 or 40,000, they would insert a 5,000 naira into that your 40,000 to make it 45,000. And that was how we were selling third parties. Me, after month one, we introduced that in about 15 centers in Abuja alone in about 15 centers of VIO office in Abuja. And we're making more than 3 million naira per day. And this was a company that had a total, a total uh, monthly expenditure of, to, no, total salary at that time was no more than 40 million. Me, from that VIO money, we could not just pay the diesel guy that supplies us in the office every day. We were also able to pay salary. As they catch people from the express or from road, and they take you to their office, one of the, aside from the penalty they will ask you to pay, they will also take you to that place to go and get your uh, original, or, original top part. While other insurance companies were doing uh, video, uh, TV commercial advert on, on channels, some even went as far as CNN. We had our own offices, right at the VIO offices. And we're cleaning up without an advert on CNN or on China TV or any platform. So when a CEO looks at or sits down every 10 p.m. to watch China TV and sees the advert of his competitors and he calls his head of communication, why are we not on channel? Where is our own advert? Why are they playing the advert? Why is our own advert not the organization not thinking? So let me stop there because your money has expired. Thank you. Samson, who paid you money that you know that my money has expired? My money has not expired, though. My money can never expire. <laughs> it can never expire. Yeah, you know that. It's, it's there, but, but, but as usual, Samson, thank you. You, you, you don't even have an idea of um, the kind of um, impact your relationship with me has done to me. You know, sometimes you just talk, you think you just, you just say it. I, I think you, you, are, you are somebody that, um, once I listen to, there's just something that wakes up. Like what you're saying now, there's so many things people will see me do in, our, in this industry that I belong to, that they will want to 
duplicate or replicate. By the time they are duplicating that is about too late. <laughs> Look, I have a program coming up on the 11th and 12th of June. Before I threw the program out, it's a very high um, ticket program. Before the program went out, I already have five people, participants, that I've marketed to underneath and then they have given, given me their award. Some of them are paid. As I'm talking now, I have over eight people in that class. And then very soon you may be seeing some Shall I say it here? Shall I? Okay, this is it now. You may be seeing some things being thrown out in the city of Lagos. And they, people will be thinking, I am looking for participants. Not knowing that I already had, I've already had the number of participants that I need or that is needed to cover my cost. You understand? So, and again, some of the things that you said in time past was that, which really helped. This same program that I'm talking about, this same product that I'm talking about, it's, um, okay, I can say it here, it's a $4,000 program, like a 2 million era program. It, and it's on speaking, public speaking. Public speaking that people will tell you, who wants to go and listen to public speaking? Who wants to go and listen to public speaking? But from my conversations, from people that are in the premium market, I realized that it was a gap. So, bam, we created a product, we threw it in the market, and boom, people started paying for it. And it was the same product that, you know, some of my guys in the office were telling that we should go, we should go um, social media, we should do um, Zoom, we should do all those things, and start marketing five days, 10 days, let them pay 50,000, let them pay, uh, 100,000 or 200,000 to attend or to do this or to do that. Um, why they were planning that? The small ticket stuff. I just look at what they were planning. Yeah, this is soup. This is serious soup. <laughs> I just, okay, you guys continue what you're doing. I took that and I went and boom. The rest, was, like they say, the rest is history. And Samson, you won't believe just that program, the spiral effect of that program, although it's not out yet, it's still in my head, it's still in my mind, but you know, there's, you know, when it comes to strategy, you can see the path. You know, this is where to tread. And especially when you have enough resources that has covered your base, you know, you can, you can start flexing Moses. Okay, I'm coming to Abuja. I want to block the street in Abuja. I'm coming to London. I want to block this in London and everything, because you have already a base, resources, um, human resources already. You can't imagine what that uh, spiral effect will be. Just watch out, all of us should just watch out. Something big is gonna happen in Lagos, in Nigeria. I mean, when it comes to the Nia Adesanya brand, it's gonna be, and thanks to Samson, thanks to my friendship with Samson, thanks to the fact that um, uh, once in a while, you know, myself and Samson, we can stay on the phone for two hours. <laughs> he likes talking to me because he knows that I listen. He just talks and I mean, we can talk for two hours and look at what you did today. Individual exits, organizational exits. Sometimes it's the CEO that's supposed to leave because you're a lead already to the people. So just leave, step aside and let the other people come in. Is it the organization we're supposed to um, exit? What are we expanding? Product expansion, new products, or branches? And most of the things that we do, just like you said, branches. We just want to be seen everywhere. And at the end of the day, you don't even consider overhead. You don't consider all those things. And then boom, the things start crashing down. I think it was Jack Wells that said that um, when he took over General Electric, if you remember, he said, if you are not number one and number, or number two, talking to the group or uh, the members of the group of uh, General Electric, he said, it's giving you so, so, so number of months. You're either number one or number two. If you are not, we will sell you. And the ones who didn't, the ones who didn't meet up, he sold them. So thank you. And I'm, not, I'm sure a lot of us have, we have questions that we want to ask um, Samson. So 
if you have your question, yes, just yes. Okay, you have one, eh? Okay, Be, uh, okay before you yeah, take I, you, I, I have... before we take you, yes. Uh, let us ask people to go to the. Uh, is it the chat room the they chat go room. to now? Or? Yes. Just raise your hands. Okay. Yes, please just raise your hands if you have questions. Uh, remember that you need to turn on your video so that we can take the questions. You know, in, in, in research, I think what something David does is in narrative research because he, he goes as though he's telling a story, but he's, he's, he's striking some dangerous chords. Yeah. And uh, I, I have a few questions from this very loaded session. Number one is why Nigeria, why South Africa, why Egypt as the three places that you must be headquartered in order to have a, an African intercontinental, a continental influence in Africa. I know you've explained something about the valuation of the nations, uh, but I would like you to just throw more light on that. Uh, I don't know if I have three questions. Can I just throw them out so that? Uh, let's address them as we fire them. Okay. Okay, now, so, so this is the first one. Yeah, a quick one then. Yeah. If in your interest, it wasn't even a report. That report didn't come from me. McKinsey came, down, came up with the conclusion that if we're going to do a billion dollar in Africa, a billion dollar business in Africa, either in revenue or whatsoever, you can only scale, have that scale conveniently in either Nigeria, Egypt, or South Africa. So it's about your focus. It's about the state you are in your business. It's not necessarily for everybody. Like I said, when we look at companies with valuation of $1 billion and above, South Africa has eight. Nigeria only has nine. We don't even have up to 10. If we say CEO that manage that are in charge of companies with valuation of $1 billion, and above, they are not up to 10 in Nigeria. Yes, I can count everybody for you. So it's about what stage are you in your business? If your business is still within the 100 million naira yes, 500 million naira yes, please, I'm not sure that advice is for you. You know, but if you're already in, in the region of a billion dollar revenue stream. In short, let me, let, me, let me share something with you. Under McKinsey's report, they said they conducted a survey across Europe to ask people how many companies do they think have a revenue of $1 billion and above in Africa. Now, this time revenue, not valuation. It will shock you that most Europeans, a lot of them called numbers like 10, 5, 20, 30, 20, I'm telling you. McKinsey said when they did their proper research into companies that operate in Africa and the ones with revenue in excess of $1 billion, they were more than 400. Yes, $1 billion United States dollars, not any other dollar. So my point is, if you're looking at scale in terms of growth, in terms of expansion, and you're looking at that kind of target, those are the kind of countries for you. That's what I mean. Okay. Um, well, how do you classify companies? Uh, okay. Our hey, church Emmanuel, is also companies. Because, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, yes, Emmanuel why not let us do it this way? Before we take your second question, let us go to Tunji, and then we'll come back to you so that the okay. hand, there's a hand raised already. Tunji. Tunji, yes. Please, let's have your video on. And then once they can track your video, they would they would um, spotlight to you and they will switch on your mic, please. Sunjadini, I just hope this is not the person I'm thinking of. Can you unmute him, please? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll need the guys at the back end. Um, I, I don't have that authority. Okay. Hello? Hello? Yes, Tunji. Yes. Am I home? Yes, yes you, you are. are. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Yes. Um, 
I'll, before I say anything, I just want to appreciate the speaker of today. You have really done justice to the subject matter. But there is this issue I really want to talk about when you talk about the CEO exiting so that other person can take over. In the Nigerian context, do you see the possibility of that whereby the CEO who owns the organization, we want to exit so that the company can grow? How is that possible in our own context, Nigeria? Hello? Uh, thank you, Mr. Tunji, for, <coughs> for uh, the good words. And, uh, <coughs> sorry. Sorry. Um, so my, my reaction to that is this. <coughs> there is no Nigerian context anywhere. It's about your, <coughs> your personal goal and that to grow. If as a CEO, you are not bothered about what's next for your company, because you, you could actually be the problem. <clears throat> or you could as well have reached your in terms of what you could do for that company. So it actually goes beyond the fact that whether somebody is going to manage the business the way you manage the business. One of the key things you need to have put in place is, is what you call structure. And the structure is, should have to be what checkmates people such that financial decisions or human uh, related decisions are actually not taken by one person, but a group of a collection of people. <clears throat> in some of my experience over the years, I've come to realize that before the time is spent, hey, Damien, on, like can I go up? Okay, yes, yes. Can you mute? Can you yes, mute? yes. Don't worry. Okay, good. Go on, Samson. Yeah, before, before some financial decisions are taken in some organization, it may require like three or four persons to sign. Irrespective of whether you are the CEO, in short, for, for, for corporate governance issues, a CEO cannot approve for himself what will be expended by him. The ED finance or the head of finance cannot raise a payment that will be paid by him. He, he cannot initiate it. Okay, so let me give you some of my past experience. <laughs> I used to manage the former Limeridian in Abuja, known as Nikon Lottery today. I did that four years ago. When I resumed there, the head of finance had the audit department under him, had the uh, procurement under him, had store under him. In short, he was the prime minister. So every like Sunday like this, I have to make myself available on a Sunday like this, or before management meeting tomorrow morning, um, uh, Saturday like this rather, <clears throat> to look at what we need to buy for the, for, the, for the coming week. So every Monday morning or thereabout, I need to release like five million naira to the head of purchase. So in a month, the head of purchase and the head share Guess like 20 million there. You just go, go to the market and buy a few. So when I resumed, the head of uh, procurement and, uh, and the head chef approached me that I need to release 5 million there for them to stock for the week. So when they submitted the paper, I requested for what is to be procured. So they gave me a piece, what the 5 million there will be used to buy. Graciously, I approve. So when I approve, <clears throat> I call the head of store to give me the stock list of what we have in out. So let's say I leave the money on Monday. On Tuesday, I approach the head of store again. 
This is a new person that just resumed as the head of the day. Bro. Approach the head of he said, the distance between my office and the office of and the store is like me stressing myself going to the basement. But I went there. On Tuesday, I returned there for the same list. On Wednesday, I returned there for the same list. So the girl was worried. So she went to meet the head of finance. She reported to ah, ah. guy has been stressing himself oh, every day, coming to ask me for top list every day. So the head of finance came to my office. You know, you are the overall boss to all of us, and you don't need to be stressing yourself. Whatever you need, all of them report to me, majority of them report to me. Even the head of store, just ask me. I will give you whatever information you need. I said, no problem. On Wednesday, I returned there. I went to ask her for this. She gave me the list. On Thursday, I went back there. She gave me the list. Unknown to her, I was creating a data and I was analyzing those data for those days. I have picked three items from the numerous items they were going to buy. And I was waiting for those items to increase in the stock. If, let me give an example. If you have told me you will buy that we only have three cups, for instance, and you said you will buy five additional cups, I'm expecting that if on Monday that I gave you money, we only have three cups, for an example. And on Tuesday, I'm expecting that since you are going to buy five cups, I should be given eight cups that we have in the store. I was shocked when that three cups was permanent till Friday. Because by Saturday, I need to sit down to do, to approve what will be bought for another week. And this is how monies are retired. Retirement is when you give somebody a cash advance or something, and then they come back to retire the money, to give an account of what they have bought. The funny part is, the person that will approve the retirement of cash advance is the head of finance that actually paid the money. Yes, the same man that will mean it to me that, uh, that Biasa can be approved for payment is the same man <clears throat> that when it is bought, will also approve that it has been bought. So, you know, I will not see whatever that has been bought. The retirement doesn't come to me. I'm too big for that. I will only approve payment. I shouldn't preoccupy myself with was it bought, what quantity was bought, what quantity wasn't bought. So, call the long story short, I called a meeting when I realized like a lot of the items were actually not bought. I called the meeting like on Friday. Because whatever you are supposed to buy on Monday should last us from Monday to Friday. And by Saturday, I could approve another payment that should be given to you on Monday. So I called for a meeting. I called everybody from head chef to auditor to head of finance to purchaser to head of store. <clears throat> head of store, please confirm you gave me this list on Monday. She said, yes. Yeah. On Tuesday, she said, yes. Yeah. Wednesday, Thursday. Head purchaser, why hasn't this, this, that increased in the store? The guy painted. Whatever happened in the uh, NDDC at uh, the Nigeria City, uh, when they were, that thing happened live in my person. You get it? That was the end of the book. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> <you know that? laughs> that was the end of it. So, but I made sure that was not the end. I made sure I deployed her. When she came back from the hospital, I deployed her to marketing. She's going to be looking for events for me. I now brought another person as the head of purchaser. I now sat down the head of finance. The guy, <clears throat> the person that audits what we buy in this hotel cannot be reporting to me. He said, Andy, uh, uh, it is, there's something, this guy is junior to me. Uh, he's, been, he's on level so, so, so. I said, I don't care about his level. But the guy that will check what you pay for should not report to you. That is conflict. Your office cannot approve payment, process payment, and also approve retirement of the same payment. So my point is, you need to set a structure in place. When I joined the board of Nikon, there were four of us in ESCO. 
those four of us must sign before a dime reaches the account of the company. Yes. The MP must sign. In short, the MP respects himself. He doesn't approve straight away. When a member comes to him, he will mean it for vetting. When audit is done, they will send it back to him that they have audited. But when it's time to raise checks, the MP will present it at ESCO weekly meeting. And all of us will approve what is to be paid. We look at the list of expenses we want to incur, and we ask ourselves, what is the priority for payment? So the MD will not sit down on his own and call the head of finance to bring check and sign. And this was, this was a company that had assets of about 80 billion at that time. This was six years ago. So, <clears throat> If a company of that magnitude, if you don't instill some discipline, some corporate governance structure in place, you might exit to a free for all. If you do a CEO entry, you might exit the system and the system is actually a free for all. So before you consider that, whether you're in the US or whatever country, either Nigeria, put a structure in place that checkmates financial expenditure, including people, People hire people with deployment and all that. So that people don't victimize people. We all know the first one story. Let's go. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Pasani, can I take one more question? Can I ask one more okay. question? You take your question. Let's take your question. OK. Uh, so something, considering, considering population size, credit system, and uh, state of IT. Uh, apparently, the first run bank, FNB, which you mentioned, is my bank in South Africa. They are quite technologically advanced and uh, very friendly to foreigners. However, uh, the, the, the technology of, of banking in Nigeria seems to be ahead of the technology of banking in South Africa. Uh, in Nigeria, if you are sending money to someone, if you put the account number, the person's name show appears, but in South Africa, you don't have that. And some other form of security futures. So considering the credit system, because of the ID system in South Africa, credit is very, is very easy to access. I mean, banks write you letters and say you qualify for two, 2.5 million rands. You qualify for, you can get a credit card of 200,000 rands. So, and most of those credits ends up in consolidation or most of those credit ended up in, in, in bad debt. Okay, so this revenue of First Rand Bank that you mentioned, considering population size of South Africa, which is about 50 million, Nigeria is over 200 million, excluding diaspora. My question is the, 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 the FMB revenue, the FMB uh, valuation that you mentioned, is it in revenue or in interest on loans which may not be recovered? How exactly are they able to arrive at $174 billion with a lower population and a very delicate credit system? Now, you're not, unmute yourself. Sorry, sorry, you're still mute, sir. Someone needs to unmute him. Yeah. Question. Okay, you're good. Now. Okay, good. So can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, we All can right. hear you. Okay, so from what you have asked, there's a mix up. First, I said the biggest company in Africa is ProSource. And ProSource has a valuation of $174 billion, not for okay. Okay. Now, value is not the same as revenue. Okay. Now, the valuation of first round is $18 billion okay. after 2021. The valuation of GTB due to devaluation is now around $2.5, $2.6 billion. Okay. Now, when you talk about, despite the difference in population size and all of that, <clears throat> there is also the 
the interest in the quality of population. Countries like Indonesia are beginning to query, countries like Indonesia are one of the most populous countries in the world, but they are beginning to query, you know, why they should just churn out a large number of citizens as the population of Indonesia. They are beginning to ask themselves, we need to churn out quality citizens that can compete with the Singaporeans, that can compete with the Malaysians, because where they operate from in Asia, you know, the rise of quality citizens is beginning to take a front burner. So Nigeria might have 200 million people, uh, South Africa might have lesser, but what is the quality of population of both countries? But there are some figures. It also depends on the sector you operate from. You might be very innovative in Nigeria, and the innovation you have in Nigeria it does not even exist in the same continent like South, like South Africa, for an example. For a very long time, I've known about uh, this company that does SMS alert for, for Nigerian bank. Uh, possibly I remember the name, but there was a company that was in charge of that. So when I joined a group that invested in the first mobile money that was licensed by Central Bank, you know, we understood what MPESA was doing in Kenya, you know, through the Safari Com model. And we tried to replicate the same in Nigeria. But as efficient as mobile money is in Kenya, it's not the same efficiency we have in Nigeria. POS is more rooted in Nigeria than, than mobile money is rooted in Nigeria. I don't know if you get my point. Yeah. So different economies as what works for them. So then if you look at the Nigerian market, the possibility of, of keeping a large in terms of either valuation or revenue is very high if you are in Nigeria. And I'll give you a few, a few examples. <clears throat> Today, MTN Nigeria is bigger than MTN South Africa. Even though MTN South Africa owns MTN Nigeria. Now, one of the major reasons, there was a joke me mentioned when we started the conversation about plan C, plan B, plan whatever. I laugh when I see such videos. And basically, uh, it's all about how deep, how knowledgeable, about you, uh, how knowledgeable you are about the Nigerian system. I've repeated, I've said that before on this platform, and I'm saying it again. I'm not sure there's anywhere in the world I can be paid the amount I make on publishing. I'm not sure there's anybody in the world that can pay me that money. I'm not sure this level of comfort I enjoy. I challenge the image of a foreign media in Nigeria that if it was, if Belgium, where it comes from, is then the same opportunity Nigeria presents to him, you won't be spending 10 years plus in Nigeria. I told him the access I have in Nigeria, if he has the same in Belgium, it won't be in Nigeria, it will be in Belgium. That I, have, that I have access to my president, you have access to your prime minister. So we need to ask ourselves, we query ourselves, that okay, what am I doing in the same Nigeria we are talking about? So I think in, in basics about you about what you have to offer the four million population. You know, it's making whatever you are paid for. You can be drinking if COVID is a or if you are offering a, a, a business that zero solve, you might be getting out of it. And it's possible you might, in, in the question of the guy that asked about uh, stepping aside in the Nigerian context, as CEO, aside from structure, we also need to pay attention to some of our best staff that provide the best advice on the table or put the best advice on the table. And I'll give you two examples. <clears throat> the guy that is supposed to take over Amazon from Jeff Bezos, when Jeff Bezos retires in not so long uh, time from now, is actually the one in charge of the, profit, the most profitable business of Amazon. Well, a lot of people would like to copy what Amazon does by like setting up 
a, some kind of an e-commerce platform to sell you know, goods and services or whatever in Nigeria. Amazon didn't even make the money, they make websites from their retail business. And I said that before on this platform. If Amazon makes $14 billion in the last financial year, for example, 70% of that money comes from Amazon Web Services. And the guy that is taking over from Jeff Bezos is actually the one in charge of the Web Services. That's Amazon as an example. When Jack Ma decided to step down from Alibaba to go into other endeavors, the guy he handed over to is the one that was the brainchild of Alibaba single day transaction. The 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 one 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 uh, the number eleven strategy. That's like Alibaba. That's Alibaba single day uh, like a Black Friday day on Alibaba's transaction. And as at the last time. The last single day transaction exceeded revenue in excess of $50 billion, gross revenue, not net. My point is, God, I innovate that idea uh, in carrying or replicating Amazon Cyber Monday, or what we all know as Black Friday, is the one that was nominated to take over the entire structure of Alibaba when the owner retired. So in appointing new leaders, we need to pay attention to some of the most knowledgeable people, or people that know some of the most valuable advice at management meetings. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do, do, does your research perhaps cover how many companies in Africa that has uh, an excess of ten billion uh, naira, ten billion dollar revenue? You are mute. Okay, so there are two models of ranking. One is the Fortune 500 model, which is a ranking of businesses across the world by level. The other model for ranking is by market valuation of your company's world on the stock market. Because rank judge mostly by revenue, because if you talk about revenue, you talk about profitability. It's a no-brainer to be a work that makes the revenue in excess of Nigeria's valuation, for an example. Walmart makes over $500 billion, for an example, annually. But the profit is next to nothing. My point. So uh, we, can't, we deliberately did not focus on ranking based on revenue. To do the profitability of those companies. So the reason why we focused on their market capitalization and their market. Thank you. Someone is asking how can someone <coughs> how can someone access your magazine and or any product or any product? Okay, I make money from two from two means though. So one is magazine, and that magazine. Uh, people like me would tell me that uh, I'm a shiner. We don't sell our magazine. We send it to people that we think are deserving of it. You've not, you've not sent my copy. That. You've not sent my copy. I thought I was a shareholder. I will, <laughs> <laughs> I will sir. <laughs> I will, sir. So gladly I can I'm share with everybody on this platform. Uh, a soft copy. Um, maybe physical copy may be a problem because uh, I'm based in Abuja, you know, uh, but I can share soft copies and then you can see the report uh, I made mention of. Uh, so, <clears throat> and the magazine model is simply because we want the audience for the magazine to be business people, strictly business people, not aspirational, you know, not people looking to. Mm, the idea is to use the magazine to feature, we want like minds to read, to read each other. You know, there are too many stories to read in Nigeria, so we don't want to compete in that space. So the other thing I do is consulting, which, which is exactly what makes the biggest money for me. Uh, about uh, three or four months ago, uh, the Nigerian Stock Exchange, which is now the Nigerian Exchange Group, I my fair uh, as one of the key 
uh, strategic uh, partners to lead companies on the exchange. So right now, in crafting visions for companies, in doing advisory for companies, I look at companies uh, properly structured. Yeah, and if you're not properly structured, you can set up a system that includes some corporate governance processes in place and also get them such that when you want to access loan or when you need some capital raising or some capital funding for some serious business, you are not just talking to banks. Most of the billionaires you know in Nigeria today, when they need to raise certain amount of money, they are in full, the 100% attention is not on bank loan, which is the problem a lot of us have. A lot of people go to the capital market to raise money, which is what you can have as well. Need to be sure that you are going to manage money. You know, they just need to be sure that you don't move money in your company with phone calls. You know, so a few things just need to be just need to be done so you have access to the same money. But at another time, is not loan. That loan is not revenue. A lot of people misunderstood uh, the idea that, like you said, in South Africa, in Telling me I qualify for XYZ. I knew a few of my friends, just that if only they could give them one, one year. Sorry, your. Did we lose him? I don't know if it's a software problem or a network problem. It should be, it should be a network problem. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I think maybe he needs to go off and come in again. But this is quite an interesting class and he's striking yeah, some think, very serious think, scores. Yeah, I think while we're waiting for him to get back, we should just let everybody mm. know that this happens every Saturday, 7 p.m. every Saturday. So mm. uh, we're back mm. here and then it should probably uh, extend till the end of June. So um, July may be a different thing based on what I'm thinking about now, but uh, we'll let you know. But this is going to happen till June, till the end of June. That's 26th of um, June. So Saturday, 7 p.m. And also for those of us who are on Instagram, we also have um, Instagram Live um, every Thursday. Um, now, Thursday. 8 p.m. 8 p.m. We're going to have it at 8 p.m. next week, Thursday. So you can join us there also. We talk about we talk about how to start businesses for those who are startups. In case you're here and you feel that what Samson is actually saying, you know, uh, I never reached that level yet. You know, I, 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 I just want to start. I want to pick it up. So Instagram Live is actually created for you. And that's where we talk about, um, we call that entrepreneur. Entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is the birthing of entrepreneurs. So we have pre nata and we have post nata. Um, and entrepreneur is a combination of two words entrepreneur and nata. And nata is a place of birth. So Instagram Live is for startup. You want to start, you want to know how to register your company, whatever company uh, it is. What do, uh, what do you bring on board? What do you do this? I mean, the rudiments, the basics. The basics, the rudiments, the basics. It's always good you join us on Thursday. Once you join us on Thursday, it will be, it will be awesome and nice. And you get all those details as much as you can. But I think Samson is back. Did I see him? Yeah, I saw him. He's back, good. Yeah, he's I'm back. Spotlight him so that I can continue. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm too. We, we can hear you now. Emmanuel was asking if it was hardware, software, or network. I think right now it's, it's still, it's still, <laughs> I think right now it's still, it's still hardware now. I think it's hardware and software today. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's something, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. 
Ok. Yes. I'm just, are you sure you're here? I am. Okay, just talk. We can't see your face, but just, just go ahead. <laughs> Are you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can. Right. Okay. So can I go on? Yes, please. Okay, so basically, uh, like I was saying, um, a lot of us seems to uh, access loans and then uh, venture into businesses we we assumed or we are taught uh, would pay for those loans or would service those loans. And that's the mistake most times that most uh, companies go eventually venture into. Uh, venturing into some kind of expansion that they had assumed would uh, actually generate revenue. Of course, there are financial projections that support and suggest that the company would make money. But there are a couple of issues that cropped up along the line, you know, that may lead to a situation where, uh, as expected, did not happen. So maybe at another time, we can extract all of that. So actually, actually look into how do you expand? How do you double down? And then what are the kind of businesses you have ventured into that you might actually need to exit completely? Mm. And in exiting, what exiting would you recommend? Is it the shedding of leadership or replacement of leadership? or a complete you know, exit of the, entire, of the entire portfolio. Thank you. So when are you coming to do that? Thank you so much. <laughs> you, know, you know how to do the dish now. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we'll work on that. I think she can hold all those hands up. Just unmute Shego right now and spotlight him so that I can fit on this video. Once this video is done, then we'll take Shegu all up. And before, before Shegu speaks, let me just say this. You guys need to know this, that this guy called Shegu Aolo is a, is a destiny helper. He's a godsend. So if you're praying for me, also pray for him. He's, he's a terrific is, is, he, is he the publisher? <laughs> oh, no, 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 he's not the publisher. But it does more than publishing in my life. He, is, he has published my life several times. Don't worry. <laughs> just when you are praying for me, just make sure you pray for him too. So she go over to you. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, thank you for the opportunity to. I mean, for me, this is like uh, attending LBS. More like online heavy for me. <laughs> thank you, Pastor Nee. Thank you. Um, something. I I want to add. Um, you talked about. I mean, just mention it now. But I would like you to give for a few minutes to talk about it again. Talk about exit plan. Shago, I, I, Shago, sorry, is it possible yes. to have another system very close to you there? Uh, or is it is it, is it better now? Is it me that can hear an echo? No, no, it's, 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 there's an echo. Okay, there's another system that is hot. Probably somebody on the same platform with you, on this platform. No, 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 I'm, I'm the only one, one here. How many, yeah. devices, how many devices do you have there that is on? Just, just one device. But, okay. but Pioneer, I think they should check from your end. Pioneer, I think it's from your end. Okay, then we'll look at it from my end. Go ahead, Okay, can, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. You know what, Shaku, before you go on, why not just mute me? Mute me. You guys mute me for now. Okay. Is it okay now? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, fine. Okay, so uh, my question is um, about the exit plan you talked about. I... I know in this environment, um, a lot of people believe that 
I must reach a certain age. I mean, to drop the business I started myself. And I must have made a lot of money before I even think about leaving it at all. Now, my question is, at what point do you think is I did I want to leave? Either to start something new or to completely abandon my self business. Is it when the business is not doing well enough? Or is it when you think like um, the business is at its peak and it's looking like, okay, I'm achieving the best I can now. I think it's the right time for me to leave. Or I think I am getting hold. I should abandon it and hand over to somebody. So I want you to help me, help us look at this and then what you think is the best time you want to think of when to exit and think of something else to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my reaction to that is simple. In Africa, you know, we walk to the breaking point. We, there's this assumption that when it's not bad, you shouldn't change it. But you see, if you replace your exit or the exit of a certain business, whether business exit or personal leadership exit, when you place it as restructuring, it will no longer sound like exit to you. When you daily think about how do we improve on ourselves? What else can we sell to the world? We have sold this, we have sold this, we have sold that. What else can we sell to the world? We have been successful at this, we have been successful at that. How, in what other areas can we be successful? Having achieved our first and second and third successes, how do we go to the next level of successes that we need to achieve? So in determining that, the question is actually for you to answer by coming up with solutions that queries the fact that what else can we do? What are the other capabilities that we have? In what other areas do we need to venture into? Possibly there are, there are, there are low-hanging fruits that you need to develop. Possibly there are there are there are stuffs that uh, you have you know ruminated about for some time. Possibly there are other areas of interest that you could venture into, but which I've never really, really you know had your time. You know it might be that time for you to ask yourself, uh, what do what next can we achieve? What next can we do? How can we go from where we are to where we should be? You know, uh, what else can this company be? I can tell you how Jeff Bezos has moved from one business to almost 100 businesses. And he keep exiting this to go for another one. Even the Google boys that left Google to go and start Alphabet. In short, when they left Google, the idea was not to start Alphabet. The idea was just to create something new. And that was when the YouTube came in, and that was when the Gmail came in, that was when Android came in, and a couple of other things. Those boys right now have left the alphabet, appointed the former CEO of Google to now lead the entire alphabet. They are asking themselves on a daily basis, what's next for us? What's next for us to do? Now, right now, they are not looking at autonomous vehicles. They are looking at, uh, look, uh, they are looking at going head on with companies like Tesla, and new in China, and asking themselves that the world of AI, artificial intelligence, and the world of aut autonomous is actually growing. How else can we please? So you might not be retiring, so to speak. You might actually be taking up new challenges. So you might actually be looking at other opportunities that you are actually have the capability for. Or you might actually be going to build a capability for yourself to eat a refresh button, you know, at some other, at, at, on some other endeavors completely. So yes, you have been successful at this. Like the Microsoft current CEO would say, what got you successful in the first place will not get you successful in the second place. So you actually need to look at yourself and say, okay, if, because even Microsoft query themselves, 
<laughs> yes, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Office was how we made our first money. How do we make the next money? They've been looking to answer that question. When Google came, they thought they could compete with Google by launching Bing, if you remember. They're still Bing still today. But not much traction was, was gained with what they launched to counter Bing. Because the moment you as a CEO go on the defensive with your competitor, or you go on the area of responsive, reactionary process, and it's not like you sat down to say to yourself, that this way we are making money, is it sustainable? When people talk about sustainability of business, which is a complete thing I want us to examine in our next meeting. Sustainability of business should, can we continue to make the kind of money we are making? Will people continue to pay us what they are paying us? Is it guaranteed that in the next five, 10 years? Yes, people forecast. You know, financial projections are always looking like we'll grow, we'll grow, we'll grow. But you need to ask yourself, what if people get tired of what we are offering them? In the days of Alabu, in the days of Bongo Tea, they never even said that there was going to be a lift. Nobody even said that there was going to be all kinds of green teas that are flooded in the Nigerian market today. Lifting and Bongo Tea back in the day were the big deal. For those that remember Bongo Tea. But who drinks Bongo today? I can't even remember. I have not even seen Bongo Tea. If you remember Bongo Coffee, no, if Bongo ever knew that Nescaf was going to come with all these decaffeinated coffees and what have you, Bongo would have retorted their process. But nobody actually sat down to query why they are making money and why that money is sustainable. So there's that assumption that by the grace of God, you know, we are very prayerful people, that by the grace of God, people will continue to patronize to patronize you, it is not guaranteed. So you need to query it yourself. Before the media industry got into trouble, New York Times had queried that will people continue to advertise? Will people continue to buy our hard copies? Yes, they had queried it. And then they decided to challenge themselves that this is not sustainable. So maybe when next we meet, we can look at business sustainability. Uh, I am talking about sustainability. I'm talking about how do we build a business to last more than a decade? How do we build a business to go from whatever structure you have right now? I have a friend of mine. He has been submitting the name of one company for everything he does for the last 13 years. Just two months ago, I sat down with his lawyer to create one company for each thing he wants to do. Now, God, we can't continue to submit the same proposal, the same company name everywhere. Even me, that I don't have your kind of money, I have more than 10 companies. The name of the magazine company is not the name of my consulting firm, but they share a similarity in name. So when we look at the source, the ability of your business, we can look at the revenue model, how you make money, and then what are the other areas you could be even venture into. But those ones are beyond Zoom. Yes, we can talk about one or two things on Zoom in terms of give an idea, but in implementation, it requires more than that. And one size does not fit all. It's specific to each business. Any other question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next time, sustainability, sustainability, and everything. You have, you, you have, you have given your word here. Before we start dragging it, when we now see ourselves, so uh, you've given your word. So we have to get you back on this platform, probably in June. Samson. Yes, please. Hope you know my best day is coming very soon. You have to be in Lagos. You know that. <laughs> oh, let's make it happen. What day is yeah. it again? You have to be in Lagos now. I'm I'm celebrating my 50th. Ah! 
Ah! It's a big one. 27th of June, so you have to be there. So you hold me a birthday gift. You have to be on my platform like two <laughs> before that day. Sorry, no, once before that day and then once after that day. <laughs> <laughs> so it will be an opportunity for some of us who are here also to see probably something for the first time uh, because I'll make sure that he sleeps in Lagos that day and uh, he's not going anywhere uh, so do, Madam, do we have any other question do we have any, any question is Emmanuel on the call okay yes he is I'm not sure we have any. Good. Okay, if we don't have any, why who is who muted them, Emmanuel? Can you unmute Emmanuel, please? Yeah, thank you so much. I say your your birthday gift is in kind, not in cash. No, if he gives me cash, I won't reject it. Samson, if you bring cash off. <laughs> I won't mind that. No, no it's a good one. I have to come. No, you must be there. You have to be there. Samson, please, just one last question before we before you give us your last words. Um, you talked about MTN Nigeria and MTN South Africa. <coughs> Isn't it because Nigeria does not have uh, a consumer protection system that works such that uh, rates are charged higher than they are charged in South Africa? I think in South Africa, communication is cheaper than Nigeria, not data now, but uh, cost of uh, uh, phone calls is cheaper in South Africa than in Nigeria. Isn't that why MTN Nigeria is making more profit? Okay, so let me quickly clear that. Um, first, we have to, we have to uh, be clear with ourselves about how MTN started <coughs> and where they are right now. Um, from their entry in the year 2000 to the 2001, when they were granted the first line set. So MTN is 20 years in Nigeria, or 21, thereabout. I was part of how MTN did their private placement to go from 18 state or 17 state to rest of the 36 state. And that was as far back as 2008, 2009, and all that. <clears throat> now, at that time, people didn't even believe in MTN. People didn't believe. All people, so at that time was because there were too many of them. There was MTS Wireless, there was Retail, there was there was Zin. Zin had changed hands like four or five times. So I remember how we were even marketing, begging people. The company I later worked for was begging people at that time to buy MTN shares for $27 per share. But a lot of people didn't believe in the growth of the company. You know, people just felt they would fizzle out. Because again, if you look at Zen, uh, uh, Celtel, uh, Mobile, Econet story, they weren't stable. So the possibility could be that maybe these guys will soon crash out. But they had a large population of Nigerians that were interested in communicating with each other. So what MTM brought to us was to solve a perennial problem. A, 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 a terrible service that was being provided by a government institution at that time, known as Lighter. What MTN came with was a solution to, to that kind of bad problem, bad service that was being provided by Lighter at that time. And they cashed in on it. They cashed in on good service. They cashed in on the fact that they even gave some bonus. There, there, were, there, were, there was no time, you know, that MTN came up with the idea that, ah, you know, they, you could get uh, uh, well, well, uh, MTN cool or something, extra cool at night, that you could talk from certain time to certain time. A lot of Nigerians got soaked in. 
And I must explain something to you. That when MTN, even MTN, when they came into the game, their revenue model at that time was not even airtime. It was SIM card, if you remember. 30,000. Correct. The core of their financial model was based on the fact that SIM card was going to go to make your money. It was an indigenous man like Adenuga that felt the money was not in the SIM card, but in the airtime. Was that the that came up with the idea that you shouldn't charge people for 50 naira for what didn't make up to 60 seconds? That if you charge people per second for the number of calls they make, for the number of minutes or number of seconds they spend on the phone. That was that the model. That was that the guy. It was that the guy that came up with that strategy. That your revenue model is not in the same car. Your revenue model is actually in the data. But when the Kim Bello or Sagi led the Tisa Lab came into the came into the trade, they said it is neither SIM card nor airtime that was the model that should actually drive the revenue. There was data, internet. That we are in an internet age, and people should that telecom companies should focus on data as against airtime. And that was how the Kim Bello or Sagi led management led board created a culture, they created a product that was millennial driven, backed by a lot of artists. These were the same artists that MTN was using for Star Trek. These are the same artists that MTN was using for uh, Project Fit. And these are the same artists that Etis Alliance used to drive the sales of data. So you can have, you and I can have access to the same artists, but we can use them for different purposes. So my point is, the difference in their market in Nigeria and South Africa, apparently Nigeria contributes more than the number of subscribers than South Africa and even Iran. It wasn't in Iran, it's in Iran as well. So Nigeria contributes more. And if you look at it, they have also come to realize there are two South African companies now that have decided to put Nigerians on the front burner of their manager in terms of day to day. And I'll give you two examples. First is MTA. That removed the South African movement, Fred movement, and installed in Nigeria, uh, Carl Toriola as the CEO. Next is Tambic IBTC, that elevated the former CEO, Shola David Boa, to Africa region in South Africa, and then exited the South African guy that was leading. In short, Sonny, there was a guy called Inka Sonny, that was the former CEO of the West African region. He has not been elevated to air the entire African region and replace him with another Nigeria, Demola Shogunle. So if you look at the strategy of South African companies, they have seen some of the best in all, some of the best Nigeria that they could put forward to run their business. And those guys know the numbers. They know where to play to. They know what to offer you and I. So we obviously contribute different markets. And then we obviously have different population. You know. So the population of Nigeria may play more. In short, in Nigeria today, FDN Nigeria is the highest company when it comes to revenue. Is there, they make more money than Mango Cement. Yes. So if you rank Nigerian companies by revenue, FDN Nigeria will come straight before Mango Cement. About 1.4, 1.5 billion, billion dollars. Every, uh, 1.4, 1.5 trillion naira, sorry. Every year. Yes, please. Any question? <laughs> wow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This thank has been an amazing, amazing session. Thank you. Pastor Lee, you can go ahead. I think I think one thing coming back to Zoom, uh, I've done for us is the fact that we have been we were, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. One thing um, coming to Zoom has done for us is we'll we, we be more, more practical, more pragmatic with all our sessions. And then it's more like strategy. It's more like thinking ahead. It's more like um, looking in words and looking at, okay, what are the things that you need to um, put in place? What are the things that you need to turn around? What are the things that you need to tweak? And um, I tell you, 
Um, Samson did not disappoint. He has never disappointed me, and he did not disappoint. And I'm sure he will never disappoint me. Uh, thank you so much, Samson, for uh, what you've done today. And I'm um, looking forward to the two other sessions. The two other sessions. <coughs> looking forward to the two other sessions uh, <laughs> that we'll still have together on this platform. I know, I, I know I'm know. emphasizing these two sessions so that I can put his integrity at stake right here because um, it's a very busy and expensive man to get. <laughs> very busy and expensive man to get. So two other sessions that we'll have with you, one before June 27th and then the other one after June 27th. And I will work out the dates um, based on your own convenience. So guys, we will be back next week, same time, 7 p.m. And please join us. I don't know the topic yet. Uh, we're going to talk about else, but um, our speaker just sent me a text that something came up and it may not be available on next week, Saturday. But we'll let you know how we'll go about it, who's going to come up on Saturday so that we can know how to, how to increase our knowledge uh, when it comes to this. Um, things are going to change. The countries are opening up already, and then we have to brace up, and we have to be ready for it. We have to brace up and be ready for it. Uh, you're not ready when the country, when the old country opens up. You're ready before they open up, so that you can know what and what you need to do, and how you need to go about things to get things done. So, everyone, thank you for joining us. Let me also say a big thank you to uh, first. The crew behind my cameras here, uh, Lani, Steven, and Steve, Kenny, Deji, um, uh, Paul, and also my guys from Stretch Media who are here. Thank you so much for being there. Emmanuel, if I know her, so the point is that what can I do without you? I can't even remember. I can't even think about it. When it comes to this platform, <laughs> you're probably the first person I always call. Where are you? Oh, yeah, get on board. And then we've become a very good team. Uh, right now. And, um, it's great. Thank you so much. The insight. When you ask your question, people will know that you are a PhD. You know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's glaring. It's so glaring. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining. And also, I have a lot mem a member of our think tank members here. I mean, that's our business think tank. Uh, they are here. Peter Kitola, Samson, Odegbami. Uh, yeah, they are here. And some of them, they go silent. They go ghost on me anyways. Uh, you don't see their name. But, uh, and also, thank you for joining all of us. Uh, my regular people, the Tokotaya.